we're live now. Um, hey, so people can see us? People can see us now. How many people, <laughs> think, how many people see us right now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I just the first time doing this, so it's been just kind of you, I'm worse with technology. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about any of this stuff. Go on. Well, uh, we're drinking some beer then. I look red. Look at this. Okay. Uh, whatever. Let's just. Let's just roll. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. So, in, in case you didn't know, we're here with uh, Corey King. Uh, we're going to talk mostly today about side projects. Um, who, uh, which Corey founded. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Perennial uh, Artisan Ales, which Corey is the main man there too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're going to talk about the beer he's produced, his experiences uh, in the beer industry, and um, originally what his original intentions were when it came to beverages. And um, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for thanks for being a part of this, Corey. Hey, no problem. This was great. So, just drink beer. It's easy. Like, hey, let's talk and drink beer. Done. Yeah. That's it. You know, it's, that's what I like to do about this. You know, it's uh, just it's it's an easy thing to do. <laughs> Go ahead. So, yeah. all right. So for for people who don't know, um, I guess if you can go just a little bit into uh, perennial and side project, what your role is with each. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then we'll start talking. Just how it's all structured and everything. Yeah, because that seems to be a big question with a lot of people. It's like, how, what, what, how, what do you do? How does this work? So um, I'm the head brewer of Perennial Artisan Ales. I've been there since day one. I, Phil and Emily and Russ, founders, um, hired me before they opened. Um, so we've been, I've been there now for just over three years. We just had our third anniversary. Um, during the midst of all of it, the, the growth and everything, and uh, it, which has been awesome there, one day, kind of, Phil was just like, Corey, I tell you, I can tell you have the drive that you eventually want to have your own place. And I was like, you're right, but I wasn't working on anything. You know, I wasn't trying to leave or anything. I love my job at Perennial, hence the reason I'm still there as well. But I was like, yeah, it would be great to just have that freedom to just brew whatever I wanted to when I wanted to. That's just my mindset, and I knew eventually I wanted to have my own place. So we started working on things together. Uh, he started, you know, kind of training me on how to uh, – you know, all the, all the nitty gritty behind the brewery stuff, like, you know, financials and stuff like that. And just kind of started training me. And eventually one day we thought I would just leave, but then they came up with the idea of, Hey, why don't you just start your brewery right here? Kind of like a gypsy brewery slash tenant brewer slash, you know, all those, you know, terms. But, um, I actually worked there. So I brew my own beer and I was like, this is amazing. I, I can continue to work full time at perennial and then nights and weekends, um, I lease the brew house and some space from Perennial and do side project. So I don't own anything of Perennial. I'm just a head brewer there. And uh, however, side project is 100% mine. I own, operate every last bit of it. Um, just thanks to some generosity from Perennial, letting me uh, allowing me to create my business inside of theirs and you know lease and do all that thing. So side project became this 100% barrel aged brewery inside of Perennial Artisan Ales. Um, I do my production there. I brew there. Um, people always want to stop by and see it. Like, there's not really a lot to see with Side Project. It's just a bunch of barrels sitting. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm not there because I spend a lot of time there. You know, like, hey, can I come by Saturday and look at them? Like, you can. I won't be there. I, you know, if I'm not brewing, if I'm not brewing, I'm somewhere else because I'm there a lot. So yeah, it's just grown. It's been crazy. Uh, people have been really, 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 really warm towards the beers. They've they've enjoyed them and. Uh, I've been very honored by that, and uh, I'm glad that other people are sharing the love of sour beer, kind of as much as, as my, maybe I am, and as much as I uh, like brewing them. It's a it's a lot of fun. So yeah, that's my little brewery. It's just it's it's grown. I've did about 100 barrels production last last year, which is tiny. You know, people brewing on 100 barrel brew houses. I, <laughs> but the you know the tough part is is I brew all those batches myself. I do all the packaging myself. I do all the barrel work and racking myself on on off hours and stuff, and I just do what I can. But um, but yeah, we're hoping to grow it. I'm hoping to grow next year. I say we now. Finding officially, my wife is part of the company, just her and I, and um, we just opened a little tasting room, and we're trying to just kind of. I just want to grow it to the point of where I'm happy making beer, and I'm already happy. I just don't want to make too much where I become stressed out about it. You know. Right. These beers don't need to. These beers can't be massively produced, and you'll right. lose you'll lose a little bit of it, and you lose the blending, and then you start worried about volume. And I don't ever want to worry about volume, and just worry about making as good beers as I can. 
So yeah, and, and, it's a complicated thing, but that's kind of how it is. The setup. So yeah, it's. I mean, it's like a it's like a relationship that I think could only happen in the beer industry. <laughs> it's like uh, it's a well, you know, it's, yeah, it's funny. Um, the beer industry they don't have a lot like this, but the wine industry is kind of common. In the wine industry, you'll have a lot of winemakers who work for big houses, and then they have a private label, and you can almost think of it as like Side Project's my own little private label. Um, sure. You know, yeah. you know, what I mean? yeah. The first person that put it in perspective for us was last year. We were out in Napa sourcing oak and some fooders. And um, one of the winemakers, we kind of explained it to them, and they're like, oh, private label, like no big deal. And any brewery you talk to or brewery, and we tell them our setup, they don't have, they don't get it. They're like, so you have a brewery inside a brewery? Like, how does that not conflict? And like, how would it conflict? I mean, you know, so many breweries are expanding, and the people leave and start their own. Why not just do them in the same house under the same right. roof? So I guess, I guess what I meant by that was the, uh, there's, a, there's a sense of like camaraderie and teamwork in the <laughs> industry. And it's a, uh, you know, obviously there's competition. There has to be competition. Competition is a good thing. Um, it pushes everybody to be better. But there's like a, I have a question. I'll just pick up the phone and call another brewer, and mm -hmm. they'll give me the answers. And you know, there's no issues. Oh yeah, you need to. Like what's happening now is Russian River and uh, Firestone Walker. Yeah. You know? So it's like, it's it's an industry like uh, like no other. You, you, another industry, Firestone Walker, would have said, yeah, go screw yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like sweet, it's a space for us to grow into. You know, like. Fire's going to be like, sweet, we can go take all those planty taps. You know, right. if it's a different industry, you're exactly right. You're right. Exactly. It is. It is. We fortunately work in a really great industry. You're right. I love so, calling up uh, and having questions. It's like, hey, help me with this. It's like, this is so weird. We're not competition. We really are all just trying to move forward. Right. And I don't think that competition will ever get strong enough. It'll be after our lifetimes, I think. It's going to take a long time for craft to ever grow to that, that right. level. So, well, there's, yeah. there's something to be said too for you know I guess it's good for a perennial to have a you know you doing what you're doing and it's good for you to be with perennial because you guys are doing two different things and and you're bringing people in the door to get something that they're not doing and so why not pick up some perennial beer while I'm there and yeah it does I mean I I I hope I don't I don't get to see the numbers but I hope and I feel like that's probably why they keep me around uh, is the side project releases are only sold at perennial, have been only sold at perennial for the last year. And during those times, you know, those are good business days for the tasting room. Those people come in, they buy some side project, they stay around, they drink. The, you know, the bartenders make a little extra cash on like a Wednesday when I, you know, do my releases on a different day or something. And right. um, yeah, it's been a really good, it's been a really good union of the two businesses. And now we're, we're in the process of sourcing a new building. Uh, perennial needs more space. Um, I'm in. I'm the director of Oak there now as well, so I'm in charge of all the Oak Asian program at Perennial, and we're really going to start focusing more on Oak at Perennial. And with that, I'm going to lease more space from Perennial to make more Oak Age beers for Side Project. So right. together, we're just looking for a larger space, and I do all the Oak sourcing now, pretty much, and it just works. Where you have one guy, or me, like doing my Side Project thing, and it's not that hard to go. We'll throw an extra 50 barrels on that order for Perennial, you know, because we're already. And so you start sourcing things together, and shipping goes down, and it right. just it just works. And side project, I don't need a brew house every day with these be you know these beers. I'm not brewing every day. You know, right. You're putting batches into oak, and then you wait. Um, so it wouldn't make sense for side project to ever go try to buy a brew house. You know, this is incredibly expensive for right. something that I would use once a week, once every other week. You know, this just depending on the season. So sure. yeah, it works so far. So uh, going back a little bit into uh, how your boss kind of started realizing um, you were one day going to have your own place, I, I read somewhere that uh, that you were sent like a quote for a brew house. <laughs> I was. I was actually, yeah. And the funny thing about that, that's what started the conversation. But I honestly wasn't sourcing anything or even trying. I was at CBC the very first year Perennial was open, and I was out at CBC, and you know, you walk around and all the vendors are there, and I just, I was just generally curious, and I walked up to a vendor and be like, hey, how much is a brew house? I was not quoting out anything for a brewery, just really a question. I don't even know, I work in a brewery, and I have no idea what a brew house costs, you know, just didn't. Right. Walked up, and he goes, oh, well, you know, and started talking or whatever, and so we exchanged business cards, and then sure enough, he ends up calling the perennial when I wasn't there, and be like, hey, I got Corey's quote together for a brew house, and <laughs> You know, that's a pretty awkward conversation to have, and I'd only been there for like a year, and I was like, Phil, man, I am sorry. I am not trying to leave. I honestly 
And then he was like, well, I can tell that you may want to leave eventually. And then that's how it spawned the conversation. And then he's like, yeah, wow, this dude put me in a tight spot. So uh, I can't remember the company. I always swore I'd never buy anything from him. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't remember who it was. But yeah, it was, just, it was just a misunderstanding on that side. But, yeah, that's how, it, that's how the initial conversation started. That, that's a good <laughs> – I read that story and I, I laughed at myself because that's, yeah. that's an awesome story. What did, what did you do before um, – what were you doing before Perennial? I know you got a – I'm just going to sound creepy, but I know you have like a, a master's in business. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do prior to beer? So prior to beer? Uh, that's a good question. I started in fine dining in grad school. Um, so my background – my first love was wine, really, wine and whiskey. Um, when we moved up to St. Louis, I went to school down in southeast Missouri. When we moved up to St. Louis – I got a job at a local distributor selling wine. I was a wine salesman for a while and um, loved wine. Um, the industry is a lot different. God, it's a lot different than the beer industry. And um, I thought, I was like, you know, I want to make, make wine. I want to start going that way into the industry. All right. And quickly realized that I couldn't make, you know, I could make good wine maybe at home. Maybe. I never tried. But you'd have to buy the grapes from like California, and you have to source really good juice. And I felt like that was almost cheating. Like if I was going to make it, I wanted to be involved with everything, and I wasn't bound to pick up and you know I wasn't bound to pick up and move out to California. Um, and unfortunately, the grapes grown here in Missouri make really bad wine. I don't care what anybody says. I, I tell everybody Missouri wine so bad. So um, it, it kind of bugged me. So I was like, oh, I guess I can't do that. My brother-in-law at the same time was getting big into home brewing, and. Uh, I wasn't a beer lover, but he started giving me some of his homebrews, and I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is really great, something different, something unique. Um, how does this work? And then I realized you could make some of the, you know, you can make world-class beer in your kitchen because you have access to the exact same ingredients that any other brewery in the country does, for the, you know, and it becomes, it comes down more to you, you as the producer as opposed to where you're sourcing your ingredients, and that, I was kind of hooked there, so I started homebrewing. And um, then I knew I wanted to get into the beer industry, and I thought I was going to do sales on the beer side. And then, I, you know, my wife got into sales on the beer side first at Goose Island, and then I realized I wanted to brew. And she, you know, watching her do sales and everything was great, but I was like, I don't want to do sales anymore. I want to be a brewer. And kind of it just, you know, morphed in there. I left, I left wine sales and ended up uh, managing a craft beer bar here in St. Louis. And, um, you know, managing a craft beer bar, you meet anybody that comes into town for any brewery is going to go by there stop. There's even a lot of people in the industry and uh, I had a lot of time to read in the mornings because I didn't work at nights and read an article about Phil opening up Perennial and I started stalking him. <laughs> so, yeah, I did. I was like, I want to work for you because his the article I read said he wanted to come to St. Louis, he wanted to make Belgians and he wanted to do barrel aging. Right. And he was from Half Acre, right? Originally? Ha oh, actually, originally uh, Goose Island. He oh, was okay. a manager at Goose Island. So he, a lot of barrel aging at Goose and then he left Goose in his interim to go be the head brewer at um, Half Acre. They were kind of in an explosive growth period, and they needed some help. And while he was at Half Acre in the interim, they kind of were teaching him, hey, this is, you know, the business side of things, numbers, dollars, you know, growth, all this stuff. So he learned a little bit there before he came in and started Perennial officially. So, yeah, so I started talking to him, and he hired me without any brewing experience, other than, you know, I home brewed for a while. Um, but I say it's pretty gutsy on his part. What'd you say? Pretty gutsy on his part to hire a brewer who's never. Yeah, I was. I was pretty persistent. I don't think I was gonna let him not hire me. So uh, <laughs> I would have worked for free. So. Have you always been a very creative person? Because we're gonna get into your beers in a little bit, but your beers are. I mean, you're pushing the envelope on fermentation. Um, on. I mean, the labels of your beers are beautiful. They're very wine-like labels. Mm -hmm. uh, have you always been a creative person? Is it something that's kind of driven you? Um, honestly, I would have to. I, honestly, I'd say no to that. I'm. I am not. Uh, my mind's more math science side. If that makes sense, you know, you would think of those people that, uh, you know, creative drawing stuff like that, uh, writing, reading. Like that wasn't my forte. I liked, you know, math science side. So my my degree is actually in chemistry, and um, I've always liked to build things, work on things. Um, and it's funny how like brewing is like you're really like building a beer and fortunately I get to use my chemistry background a lot more now than I ever anticipated when I was in college. I just did chemistry because I like that side of things. I thought I was going to be a pharmacist at one time. That was the most miserable summer of work I've ever experienced in my entire life. But 
Yeah, and then like being locked up in a box all day long. It was a horrible. right counting pills. Yeah, it's all you did. You count. You count. It's like this is horrible. But but yeah, that background in mind, like always, like the science side and um, the as far as the labels and stuff. You brought the labels. That is all one of my best friends, um, Tim, and legitimately like one of my best friends. Not that's not just saying it for the word. He was actually he was in my wedding and um, a guy I met in college. And when we started doing this, you know, side project, the project of this, he he was like, hey man, I'm going to do your labels. Unfortunately, I have a very talented friend. Um, you know, it'd be it'd be one thing, but uh, but he works for a, a great company here. He's a graphic designer, and um, I only thing I told Tim was like, I want a wine label. Like you have to understand, these beers are all gonna be in oak. They're aged for a long time. I I love the feel, the classy feel. I'm not a, you know. Uh, let's make up a pun name, you know what I mean, with this in-your-face aggressive label, it's not me. Um, but like I said earlier, my background's a little bit more wine inside that side. So, yeah, he does all that, and that is him. Me, it's just making the beard and uh, going that side of it. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, creative, not really. I like <laughs> he's, he's, really in tune to your, he's really in tune to your beers and your style because, I mean, the, you know, when I look at the labels, and I guess here's one of them, uh, this is what I'm looking at. Yeah, but, I got, I'm drinking unblended. So where's that? Oh, nice. There's this one. So I, I, I can actually say something. This picture is actually I actually took that picture. This is the one label I actually helped out on. I took the picture of that barrel with my iPhone and I sent it to my buddy. <laughs> nice. that's, the only, that's the only label I've ever helped on. But you know, obviously he did his magic and made it look a lot better than just my iPhone pick. But uh, right. well, it's they're they're in tune with each other because I, I think a lot of Again, and it's it's crazy how it works, but I think as people we're kind of like drawn to an image, or a, you know, that's, that's where marketing I guess kicks in. Um, but you know, the the labels seem to match the style of the beer. Um, Thanks. This, I guess now would be a good time to take a little break from the timeline, I guess. But I guess what is this beer? I, I would review it, but it's better coming from you. I think people would rather hear it from you. So, <laughs> what what is it, what is this beer? You know what it was your inspiration behind this beer, um, the name, um, and yeah, I guess if you can give us any backstory on on how this beer came about. Yeah, um, so beer to pay. Uh, the more the more I try to learn about um, saisons, farmhouse ales, the more you know, just muddy the water gets. If that is, there's just no, there's not a lot of I feel like def definitive like answers to a lot of these beers. Um, my wife and I took our first trip to Europe this year to go over and kind of try to drink as many farmhouse ales as we could find. And uh, that, sounds that sounds like a horrible trip. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. I'm glad we could jam it in and get over there. Really, it was bad. I, 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 I it was bad that I'd never been to Europe, and I'm so mad at myself for not spending a lot more time over there when I was younger. You know, you always have those friends that go over there and backpack and stuff, and I was like, that's stupid. Now I'm an idiot for not going. You know, it's so dumb. But we had an amazing, amazing, amazing time, and uh, just the the more I learned about Cezanne, the more it's so, so localized, and you could have two towns that are 10 minutes apart, and they make, both of them make, a guy there makes Cezanne, and they mo both make them very, very differently, and they don't even know that each other are making Cezanne for the most part, they don't, you know, I mean, it's like, it's just so localized, and it's obviously a little more, uh, it's, it, but people know more about it now than they used to. It used to. It used to be so, so, so localized. And right. they're, you know, the, the, even the term Saison, you, you can find a grisette, which is almost eh, Saison-like. You Saison, low ABV, uh, you know, a beer to pay, country beer, low ABV, country beer. I mean, pretty much they're all Saison, just called by a different name, depending on where you were. And so for me as a brewer, um, that's one of the, the big things for side projects that I always wanted to make sure that I can be a brewer and not just a, you know, like a button maker. We have to make the same thing over and over again. That can really right. what I want to make. So beer to pay for me is um, I'm known for making saisons that are a little tart. Um, I like acid in my beer. I like the acidity. Uh, I made a traditional saison recently. I guess you can say, I don't know how you want to say traditional. To me, traditional is refreshing, drinkable, low ABV. That's traditional. But from that, you can go hoppy, you could go a little bit bready, you could go tart. Um, to me, there was a lot of different ways to express traditional saisons. And uh, my first my first traditional saison was grisette, which is a little hoppier, um, a little bit of bread note. Beautiful. Did I, send that? Did I send that to you? 
Yeah, have yeah. it the other day. It's, it's a beautiful beer. Okay, good. Oh, well, I'm glad. Thank you. I that's one of my favorites I've brewed so far because it's um, I know it's just fun because I so many of my beers have an, an big acid note to them and that one doesn't. So I find myself drinking a lot of that because to me it stands out. It's very different. Um, right. Funny, so many people review it like, oh, it needs more acid. I'm like, oh, does it? You're telling me it needs more acid in that beer? Like, I chose not. That, I don't want that one to be sour. I want beer to pay to be a tart beer. You know, so right. beer to pay has my full. Um, Saison cocktail in it. It actually is the same malt bill and water profile as Grisette, but hopped differently, um, okay. allowing the bugs to kind of do their thing differently. Um, whereas Grisette, same malt bill, water profile as Beer Du Pay, um, hopped higher, which actually slows down. It has the same cocktail as uh, Beer Du Pay, but they say it's so differently because the hopping rates. I can kind of control my acid production and uh, through a couple other different things uh, that I do, but. Uh, but yeah, I wanted I wanted them to be, you know, very 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 sessionable, very very traditional, right. drinkable, four percent or refreshing. That is saison, at least from what I can find, what I can read, what we experienced while we were over in Europe, and uh, it it was cool. So I, I eventually will make another saison like beer that'll fit in that same category, and it'll probably be. I'm probably just going to call it house beer, and it'll be like draft only at my tasting room now because we had a lot of places that had a house beer over there, and which yeah. is great. Just drinkable, beautiful four percenters, you know, three, four, five percenters. And uh, did I say enough on beer to pay? I guess I uh, – yeah, oh, beer to pay, aged and chard uh, – used chardonnay barrels. Sorry, I guess go back to that. Same Hallville, same water profile as Grisette, um, Pilsner, yeah. Pilsner wheat oats, uh, a little acid malt. Uh, <laughs> Eight. Your answer was your answer was a good one. I, I was, long. It's long. I'm long winded. Sorry. I get I get I have an attention span problem. I swear. I I can't even <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. But Asian um, Chardonnay barrels with my saison cultures and uh, till that acidity and then uh, bottle conditioned unfiltered bottle conditioned beer um, sure. as you experienced yeah. earlier. Yeah, and I can show a picture of it uh, or on the on the camera. It's a beautiful beer. I mean, it's like it's it's. It's extremely delicate. You get the Chardonnay aspects of it, um, and it's it's really. I mean, look at it, unfiltered, beautiful beer. Um, you know, we we kind of talked about what you were talking about, where in Europe you've got different different brewers brewing the same you know style, having their own kind of uh, style in, in their own neighborhoods. I kind of talked about it a little bit with Jeff Stuffing from Jester King earlier this week, where he kind of sees. The U.S. starting to revert back to a tradition of you've got your neighborhood brewery, you've got your neighborhood, um, um, you know, butcher, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what they're trying to do is, you know, create a sense of, I guess, here we go with wine again, terroir with um, the yeast profile that they use. Do you find that it's something that's, with, especially with your wine background, something that you're trying to do with your beers, create your own kind of terroir? Yeah, all of um, so all of my cocktails now, even my saison cocktail, all my wild oak cocktails, um, all have wild Missouri yeast and bacteria in them. So um, I feel as though Side Project has a house character now, like a house flavor that's uniquely Side Project. If you blindly put, you know, there's a lot of tart saisons out there now, right. and I feel like if you were to drink through them all blindly, you could pick out, you would see the difference between each producer now, and you know the way like Sean at Hill Farmstead or like Tim at Sante Darius, like. They both make tart saisons as well, but I, and I and I think all three of ours are uniquely different. Um, and one of the things I always tell people is like, yeah, I have wild Missouri yeast and bacteria in my beer. The only way to replicate that beer, you don't get to call the lab and order up the yeast that I have. You have to just you know take the yeast from one of my bottles to create that, or be here in Missouri. So yeah, this is something I want to do. I want I want Side Project to have a house character, and hopefully it's a house character that people enjoy and. I enjoy it, and if I didn't, I would, you know, rethink that idea of doing wild Missouri yeast and bacteria. But, um, but yeah, it does. All so all my cocktails have some kind of wild yeast, wild Missouri yeast and uh, and bacteria in them, and it it creates that sense of place, like the what saison used to be, what a lot of those beers used to be. It, it tastes unique here for this area, and uh, obviously the way I blend and brew is another aspect to that, and it creates its own own flavor for side project because even even the sour beers I make for perennial they don't have wild Missouri yeast and bacteria in them so they don't the side project is very unique uniquely different than what I have at perennial as well right right what are, what are some of the favorite beers I mean I think 
At Perennial, you're probably most well known at this point for Abraxas. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the favorite beers of brew over there that you know would never even be an issue, uh, never even be part of a concept at, at Side Project? Uh, like Abraxas was actually one of my homebrew recipes. That was um, uh, back when I was homebrewing. I wasn't making a lot of Belgian beers. I wasn't making a lot of sours. I have like two sours I made when I was homebrewing that I still are around here, still in my basement. But um, but yeah, Abraxas and you know like concept of Abraxas with a lot of these extra ingredients. It, we make a lot of more like a lot more food friendly beers. I feel like at Perennial or more culinary inspired beers at Perennial. We have a lot of extra ingredients we add to things like a chamomile saison. We have Abraxas with the uh, um, cocoa nibs, vanilla bean, cinnamon sticks, and ancho chilies. We do a mint chocolate style. You know, we do these extra. We always add these extra kind of culinary ingredients to a lot of the beers. Sure. Aside from that, I tend to stay straightforward to, you know, being a yeast for a brewer. I guess I let the yeast do its job. Um, you know, I don't add a lot of extra ingredients to to my beers other than fruit, which is traditional. Um, do you find that with with a yeast forward beers, these styles, these saisons? Uh, you end up playing a little more into actual, uh, like, you know, food, beers. I mean, culinary pairing beers. Um, it, it's been my experience, at least, that with beers like the ones you're producing at Side Project, it's easier to find. Or a little, to me, they, they go better with, like, a dinner or mm-hmm. you know, different meals. Um, is, there, is there any culinary aspect going into Side Project, like, I want these saisons to pair with certain things when I'm because I, I think it's a lot of concern for wine people is like you know this this wine is it's kind of like you know you're gonna eat you're gonna drink this with this food. Do you ever think about that having your kind of like love for wine first? Um, I don't I don't intentionally plan a beer that way. Like I don't intentionally plan a beer out and be like I want this beer to pair with something. Um, it is fun though after the beer is done to use these these little delicate beers. You know they're delicate are pretty complex. There's a lot going on. Which lends themselves well for pairing for food pairings. Um, yeah, my wine background. I love the beer dinner. I love the idea of a, you know. I love beer dinners. They've been done a million times now and almost overdone, but I still love beer dinners because I love to see when you do a great beer dinner with the right people. Yeah, where the back of the house they understand we can't make a new beer tomorrow, but the back of the house can make a dish that's new and to you know or you know by tomorrow where the back of the house wants to work with you and they taste through your beer with you and they're like, all right, we're going to beer with this. Let's make a dish for this beer. Right. There's nothing better than that because beer pairs so well with food um, when properly done. And, yeah, right. I do I do love that side. I'm glad these beers are very drinkable and approachable and uh, they do tend to, sell, tend to lend themselves pretty well with uh, with food. Except for the other day I had to pair one of my beers with a lamb meatball. <laughs> and I have either these light, delicate saisons or, you know, some acidity – and I have some barrel-aged stouts. So I was kind of missing that mid-range gap right now. I have some beers and barrels that maybe eventually would fit closer. But, but yeah, right, for me, for me right now, I, I, it, it is kind of one or the other. But, yeah, um, it is fun to pair these up, and they do pair well, which is nice. It's not intentional. They just uh, one thing, uh, like, I like what you said, lamb meatballs, because one thing is uh, a beer dinner. The other thing is, um, you know, uh, a, a beer and a burger, a beer and a hot dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it was done a long time ago. I, I, I like that now, and, and I don't know if you notice more kind of higher end restaurants, are, are they more susceptible to the idea of a beer dinner or a beer pairing dinner over a wine or, a, or like a high end spirits dinner? I don't know about over or not, but I know that uh, Perennial has been since day one big, big, big into getting beer dinners. And, um, Perennial does beer dinners with some very, very, very nice restaurants. Uh, Emily, one of the co-founders there, has been just amazing with her relationships with a lot of the chefs and, and showing what our beers can do with food at, on the perennial side. So, right. yeah, we've had some pretty serious beer dinners with some pretty serious chefs. That's really, really, really cool. And um, the, the chefs I have actually had an opportunity to talk to regarding these beer dinners have always been like, Man, the beer drinkers are so laid back. It's so different. Everybody's talking. They get laughed by the end of it. You know, just – but it is – it's – it's and, and I feel like they always tend to have fun. And yeah. uh, that's one really cool thing for our, for our industry whenever you're talking to these chefs where they're just like, man, it seems like a great time. Like, good. Right. Great. <laughs> you never want them coming out and going, man, those beer guys, I don't know about them. So, oh, I just lost you.
I guess I did. Maybe, maybe not. Well, let's see if I'm still on here or not. Let's read. You there? <laughs> there I am. So, uh, um, sorry, about, there or not. sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My computer started flipping out, and I got got all these little uh, update update alerts, and it just shut off. Um, Is, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfect. We're good okay. uh, on your this end. Microphone's not working for some reason. I don't know, but if you can hear me, that's great. I hear you perfect. As long okay, as cool. you, I think we're good, because that's never happened before. So, we were talking about beard pairings, food. Um, how much? How important? And I guess the kind of the emphasis of what I was trying to get at was the importance of pairing uh, beer with the right kinds of foods for images purposes. Image purposes. Um, how important do you think that these beer dinners and these and the right beer dinners are towards growing craft beer and growing the you know the standard what people consider uh, craft beer to be in in, in America. Uh, I think they're really important because uh, beer for the longest time is just, you know, the, the, the cheap drink, if you, if you will. And, I mean, it's got – beer is still very, very, very affordable and everything. But people need to understand why, you know, your Miller Coors AB is one price point and craft beer can be almost double, you know, depending on the beer. And when you have these beer dinners and you see these, these beers paired with food in the proper way and how they actually work really well together – I think people will slowly start – If you know, people that are going to these beer dinners will understand, but if you already got them in the beer dinner, these guys already know what's going on with the beer. But, but it is great to still show off that the flavors that are generated and, and there's a reason this beer costs more. Um, and it's not just a flavor component. It just usually is a cost of production because with those flavors comes sometimes higher cost. Um, sure. But there's a reason why you would feel comfortable paying twice as much. The same you do with wine. There's a price point for this wine. If you pay twice as much – most of the time, the wine's going to be better. So, uh, yeah, I think it's really important to show off that, hey, there's a reason these beers are a little bit more expensive. And, and you know, God, if you want to start talking price points, side projects are even, you know, a lot more expensive. It's just, it's just negative with, 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 you know, my production and time. But uh, Right. I was going to say time, time may be, as far as side projects concerned, time may be one of the most expensive ingredients that you've got. Right? It, I mean, it is. Um, when... When you think, you know, my saison, my barrel of fermented and aged saisons range from four months to seven, eight months, you know, from brew to release day. And they'll be about twice the price of another 750 of saison, only twice the price, where those other 750s of saisons, you can have a brewery pump that out in 21 days. Sure. And, you know, and, that's, and that's probably even slow. If you're doing, you know, some people can make it faster, some do it slower, depending on bottle conditioning. So if I really, if it was all about the dollar, I would just make those saisons, release them every three weeks, you know what I mean, at $10. Right. And sell, and I'd make more money technically over the long run as opposed to going for 20 and taking a lot more time. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, the time is expensive. It very, it is. I pay lease on those space, that space that that barrel is sitting, and it's, it's just, it's just part of it, you know? And I guess people don't mind because they're, they're not around long and um yeah the beer beers are are almost impossible to get um it, it's, it's amazing it's like did you ever expect that to happen i mean that's 
I follow on, on you know social media and stuff like that. Obviously, I'm not there. Otherwise, we would be sitting down in front of each other talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, it, it, from everything I read and I see, your, your beers are gone in a matter of hours. And it's maybe even less. And it's like... How do you how are you, how do you ever intend on keeping up with that demand, or do you care to keep up with that demand? Is that one of your goals, or is it I'm going to produce what I'm going to produce, and as much as I do, and that's it? Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, for, it's 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 weird. I never expected it. I never expected it. Um, you know, Perennial gave me a big boost with people understanding the beers that I'd made there, and when they had heard that I was just you know starting my own. And, I was going to do whatever I wanted to. Um, that generated a lot. And um, my first release had Saison Du Fermier included in it. And Saison Du Fermier, I think still on Beer Advocate, it's like the number one beer. It's weird. It's weird to talk about. Um, but to see that, it's like, that's crazy. That's awesome. I'm very happy with the beer. I'm very happy with the beers I've been making. And to see that the blind public respond that way is crazy. Um, awesome. It's crazy awesome. Uh, right. You know, the people that don't know me, you know, it's crazy to see that out there where it's not just friends and family going, oh, we're going to rate it. You know, it's, it's, that's, it's awesome. It's weird. I'm still learning how to deal with it. It's, it's fun. Um, because of that, the demand has always been higher than my supply. Um, sure. It just really has. I care about the fact that my supply is too low because I care about the fact that I don't want people to ever be frustrated with side project because they can't get it. You know, like we were talking earlier, I don't, I don't want the, I love beer but there's an extent to which I'm going to go stand in line for a beer. And I don't, and that's what side project is right now. Unfortunately, I wish that I could get my beer in a, in a better fashion to people. Hence the reason we opened a tasting room to do on site sales only. We had to drink it there. Um, so it does bother me. What am I going to do about that? I'm going to try to make more beer next year, but at the same time, I never want to become a slave to the demand. I, I started a brewery to be the brewer. And when you grow to a certain point, you have to either hire somebody to take care of the business side or somebody to take care of the brewing side. Sure. And I really don't want to do that at all. I don't want to hire anybody on that for those aspects. I, I really want to maintain that myself and something that I love doing. And so my, my, my volumes will always be small. They really are. Um, I'll make more beer, but it, I don't think it'll ever be to the, the amounts that maybe some people think I should or the amounts that may make things a lot easier. But, um, you know, I got into this to make beer and I, I'm going to stick to it, you know, and stay, and stay there as much as I can. So, so the, and, and the focus behind your, <clears throat> when you're producing a beer in your side project, uh, at least your website says the focus is uh, blending and yearly vintage releases. Um, so why the emphasis on that? What was it about blending and yearly vintage releases that 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 made it so much so that you made that the focus of side projects beers and then I guess I have a piggyback on that depending on what your answer is but <laughs> um, why, why did that become my focus really um like a, like a, because I want to be a brewer and I want to make I really want to make beer um, I don't want to make brands as you will like always bring the same thing over and over again so like it's like some of these saisons take on the shorter end like the four monthers I can make those three times a year tank but I'm not going to because that gives me time to brew other beer you know new things new ideas beer to pay was never planned beer just one day I'm like I'm gonna brew a sour version of this uh, you know more acidic version and we named it after I brewed it um, so some of these beers are just that's the joy of it. Like I can just brew when I want, and that's one. Of the, you know, that's because I own my own company, and I can just do things this way. And you know, you, you talk to most brewers that they they all schedule things out. I don't, because I, I have to jam things in at night and weekends and everything. So when I do yearly vintage releases, I'm I'm going ahead and telling everybody right now. Like if you, I'm glad you really enjoy that beer, but I can't guarantee that it'll be back at least for a year. You know, that's right. just that's just the way I'm going to function and work as a brewer. And on the other end of that. Um, when you say yearly vintage releases, I want people to understand that I'm not just producing this beer over and over again. It will taste different. It will not be exactly the same. You know, the blend will be different. The, you know, the, just the fermentation will be different. The aging will be different. My palate may be different. Think of it more like wine. Um, you know, you can, you can have the same wine from the same winery two years in a row and be like, oh man, that vintage is better than the other one. And do right. we ever give them a hard time about it? You don't go to them and beat down their door and go, it doesn't taste the same. Like, 
Right. It, that's not going, and it's and it's the same way with these beers. You know, there's such a blend of yeast and bacteria and everything going on in the barrel, and sourcing the barrels. And you know, if I don't get the exact same barrel from the exact same place and have the exact same wine and the exact same toast level, and we didn't have the exact same temperature in our cellar, things are going to taste different, no matter what I do to blend it. Um, at so at that people, point, do you think the the wine that was in that barrel, because we just said the wine can be different from year to year, so the, the actual wine that's in the barrel could affect the taste of the beer. Even if it's the same exact wine. Yeah, wine doesn't impart as intensive a flavor as bourbon does. You know, uh, the, you really when you drink a beer with in a wine barrel, you usually often don't go, man, I can taste exactly the wine in it. But sure. I'm also making four percenters sometimes too of these barrels, which is is not what most breweries are doing as far as barrel aging. So those four percenters right. are super soft and delicate, and the wine does impart a uh, rather sure. uh, prevalent character characteristic to the beer. So if I go one year and do Chardonnay barrels, the next year is like, man, I can't find a Chardonnay, but I got you know some vignole barrels from here in Missouri, it's going to taste different. And you may prefer the vignole over Chardonnay, which may surprise you, or the vignette, and these, these little things that are different. So I really want to emphasize the fact that I'm not going to release a beer unless I'm happy with it, and I'm not going to release a beer because I have to. So these yearly vintage releases allow me to express that this may be different than last year to a point that you may even taste it, and you may like it more or less. But that's part of the nature of my variety. Right. Right. And, and so kind of piggybacking on that, we've talked about how, you know, a lot of your beer is inspired by wine, even from the labels to the flavors to the just the, the feel behind it. Uh, I guess if you could put a number of percentage on it, what, what's your influence? How much, of your, how much of your style at Side Project is wine-based? And is it the same? I'd imagine it's less for perennial. Yeah. Um, for me at Side Project, man, the wine side of it, I would have to say is at least 50% of my production. Like the beers that I feel really were very, were very influenced by wine, by the wine characteristics, which if somebody drank my beer and goes, tastes like white wine, I would take that as a compliment. I've had, I've had negative reviews where people reviewed a beer and goes, tastes like white wine. And I, like That's a great compliment to me. I'll take it as a compliment. Thanks for your negative review. I like it. All um, right. <laughs> I find, I mean, ask to have a cocktail and to, to, to manipulate these beers in a fashion to get them to, to taste like white wine, but still beer, don't get me wrong, um, is a lot of fun for me. So I'd say about 50%, if, if not a little bit more than that. My full-on wilds are more influenced by, you know, the traditional lambics of Belgium um, with the fruit and everything and the Flanders um, region. Uh, and then I do also do some barrel-aged stouts, barley wines, Old Ale's quads, they just haven't been released yet. They are um, still aging. I have uh, my very, very first beer, The Origin, was a blend of some strong um, strong beers. Um, but my first official, like, stout, stout will probably come up here in the next couple months, which I yeah. love that barrel aging as well. We were talking about that. We were talking about your, your – you're having fun uh, – Messing with carbonation levels. Yeah. And, and there's a unique aspect to this stout uh, with regards to the carbonation level. So I, I drink a lot of beer straight from the barrel. I mean, that's all of my sampling comes straight from the barrel. And some beers I find are just absolutely stellar, just still flat right out of the barrel. I'll be chastised for it. People will be like, oh, this would be better with carbonation. They have no proof that it would be better with carbonation. That's just their personal opinion. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, this would be better with carbonation. Like, oh, can you right. guarantee? You can't guarantee. You try with carbonation? <laughs> I think it's flat every day. I think it's really good this way, and I really want to present it to you in this fashion, and this is how I'm going to present it to you. Right. So um, I have a beer coming out. I, I, it won't be bottled. It'll be draft only for my tasting room called One Candle. Um, it's, it's a... It doesn't make sense because if I, it's not an anniversary beer. But if I had an anniversary beer, it'd be an, it would be the, that would be the anniversary beer. I don't know. So it's a kind of, <laughs> but uh, it's called One Candle. It is flat. I kegged it flat. It's keg only. It was an imperial stout, smoked imperial stout, aged in an Owl Creek barrel for eighteen months. Um, it tastes like marshmallows and heaven. It's really decadent. It's delicious. And I felt that if I carbonated it, I would lose some of the mouthfeel, actually. You know, people talk about carbonation add mouthfeel, which it does. But when you have a decadent style like that, the carbonation actually does add a prickly spiciness to it. The carbonic acid that's created 
can offset some of the richness. Um, I wanted the beer to stay coating. I want it to be decadent. I want it to be dessert-like. I want it to – you don't want to drink a lot of it. It's just too big. Um, right. You can say you want to drink a lot of it, but I'm going to just warn you. It's very de- – you know, one of those things. That, I just feel like the beer tastes the best this way, and that's why we did draft only at the tasting room because we can personally sell it. You know, not sell it, but we are presenting it to somebody, and when somebody has a problem with it, we can be like, well, this is what Corey wanted to do. If you ever distributed that, everybody like, oh, it's flat. I'm like, well, you didn't read the label. You know what I mean? Like, you didn't read the label or read the background on the beer, and you are just – you think that all beer must be served carbonated. Right. Um, so yeah, it's funny. Some of my styles are, are the low-carbonation styles for the same reason you're saying. The, the mouthfeel is a lot richer. It's more velvety. Um, there's some stouts that – or, you know, the fermented on like champagne yeast and things like that, and I just, it, to me, it's a turn off because if I want a champagne yeast, I'll pick up a low alcohol content saison, like what I'm drinking right now. You know, it's um, when I'm drinking a stout, like you're saying, I want this decadent, you know, big mouth feel, big rich taste. That sounds awesome. Well, thanks. When's, the, when's that going to be available to people? Um, off and on in our tasting room. I think we're actually going to tap a keg of it next week sometime, and then I've got about nine or ten kegs of it. We'll just slowly tap here and there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I agree. I, I've, had a, I've had an overcarbonated stout before, and it was tough to drink because it was prickly, and it was foamy, and it was right. decadent and rich, and it was high ABV, and it was just like, this does not work together. Um, but then on the opposite end of that, like the beer to pay you had, a little four percenter, if that came out flat, it would be flabby. It would not be – it would have the perceived, you know, characteristics that it needs to have without having the high carbonation. So, yeah. um, and it wouldn't have. Before, it before, we, before we started the interview, I had a, I had the bottle gushing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's carved, it's carved really. It's one of the higher carb beers I've ever made because yeah. I, I find that low ABV stuff. It, it, I like the high carbonation level. It really, really adds. It, it. Yeah, it adds something to the mouthfeel that is generally. Um, and this is not at all, but generally a lower alcohol content beer, a little bit lacking in a mouthfeel. Um, I guess this is one of your fruited beers. Oh, uh, fuzzy. Nice. Yeah, and uh, fuzzy. I'm really for this, but this is, this is kind of one of the ones that everybody wants. Um, what was the thinking behind Was there any inspiration behind fuzzy? Um, you know, other than I want to create a beer that tastes awesome, is there any maybe... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Fuzzy. So Fuzzy was my first fruited American Wild Ale that I released. Um, the name's a little whimsical for for side project for sure. Um, we I first took it up to Fobab up in Chicago, a festival of barrel-aged beers, and um, I didn't have a name for the beer, and I was looking up peaches and stuff, and Fuzzy is actually a type of peach, a fuzzy peach, and I just called it Fuzzy uh, for the for the fest. And it took gold in the Wallace City category, uh, first place. So the name was pretty much set in stone then. It was like, all right, we can't change, you know, we just, you can't change the name now. Right. I'm very happy with the name now. At the time, my wife and I were talking, because I had done Saison Du Fermier and these Brett projects and Saison de Rouge and Pulling Nail. Like, I'd had all these other, like, names come through that are a little, little more in line with maybe the feel of Side Project and then Fuzzy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like it. I love it. It's, I love it now. I do. I love it now. That's how the name. It just that's that's why the name's a little more whimsical on that side. But um, the beer is um, it's a sour blonde base. The malt bill is inspired by a traditional lambic. Um, it was in a single infusion mash, so Americanized on that side. Uh, wild Missouri yeast and bacteria a lot. About fifty percent of the cocktail was straight up wild Missouri yeast and bacteria that I caught on my family's farm. Don't even know what's in it. Um, can tell you what's in it. You know, I don't know how many lactose strains, bread strains, anything. I have no idea. Just a just a cocktail that's been doing me well for a while. And from that, I was like, all right, I want to make a sour beer that exemplifies Missouri. What you know, I had this wild yeast in it. The oak barrels. It was fermented and aged in Chardonnay barrels. The Chardonnay barrels are Missouri oak. They were actually from just southwest Missouri. So Missouri oak, Missouri yeast and bacteria. Um, and I wanted to add fruit to it. And um, my family still lives in southeast Missouri, and we have a peach producer down there that makes, grows absolutely amazing peaches. Um, Missouri actually grows some really great peaches down in the sand belt of southeast Missouri. Went down there, uh, actually called them up and asked them when they had peach. Actually, when are you going to have white peaches? White peaches are my favorite varietal. I've been always been a big fan of if I like to eat the fruit, I'm going to put the fruit in the beer, you know, if, if I like to eat it. If I don't like to eat it, what's the point? 
And uh, I called them up. I was like, when do you have white peaches? Or do you have white peaches? Like, yes. And they're like, I was like, when? And they said, tomorrow. I was like, all right, I'll come later this week. And they're like, no. No, they'll be gone. We have them tomorrow if you want them. So I got up at like 4 a.m., took a half day of work, drove down there, picked up a truckload of white peaches, came back. That night, I had the peaches into the beer already. So this is about as quick as you get them in there. I ate probably 10 peaches that day. I think I was going to be sick from eating too many peaches. But uh, they're, <laughs> they're absolutely beautiful white peaches, beautiful, beautiful. Um, you know, that obviously – there's so much peach in that beer that it imparts a big flavor to that beer – that the peaches themselves are, um, you know, an important part in where I sourced them from. And it's, it's a really cool opportunity for me to say that Missouri peaches, Missouri East, Missouri Oak, um, just trying to create beers that are unique to here and really can't be replicated or can be, but they just won't taste like side projects. And I didn't want to be another sour producer that tastes like every other sour beer out there. Um, and just really try to create these, beers that I like to drink, but are also uniquely different in a good way, hopefully. So that's kind of what happened with Fuzzy. And now I source as much local fruit as possible. Um, not all fruits, like apricots. I can't get apricots here in Missouri, so I have to source them elsewhere. But there's a lot of fruit in Missouri, and um, it's been a lot of fun sourcing it because you end up dealing with, like, farmers or just people. Like, I've got all these raspberry bushes, you know. You come pick raspberries, you can have them. Like, all right, this is, you know, just really, that's a lot of fun, and, and a lot of grapes. We do have in Missouri, like I said earlier, I don't like the wine, but we have some great grapes here um, that go well in some beers. Like, I do Blanc de Blanc. I think, did I say yeah. Blanc de Blanc? Cool. Yeah, that is, we reviewed it on the, we actually reviewed it on Craft yeah. Commander Stuff. So if uh, anybody wants kind of my take on that beer, it's up there. Um, that thing was amazing, that was amazing beer. Amazing, amazing, amazing beer. That's, it was local Missouri grapes. Yeah, it was. They were Chardonnay grapes from just south of St. Louis, a little uh, winery called Charleville Winery. Um, and Chardonnays are a Savoy Blanc hybrid. Um, create a wine, yeah, similar to, I, for most, if you don't know wine, we'll just say Chardonnay. Um, Savoy Blanc was a hybrid, though. But uh, cool grape, grape that we use in some perennial beers um, and did some good things. It was a beer to champagne base with grapes. Uh, whatever was on the grape was the wild yeast bacteria for the beer. I'm so Missouri, and uh, it's 10%. Drinks like it's five. Yeah, that's. It'll it'll that's warm you up. Down your, it'll warm you up at the bottom of the bottle, but at first it just drinks like a five percent. Then you're like, whoa! I kind of feel some warming. I think I'm warming up here now. This is kind of good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That beer was that beer was beautiful. I mean, um, I'm dying to get into this fuzzy because uh, that beer really it blew my mind. It was. Um, the grapes really came through, but there was so much complexity to that beer. Um, I mean, it was like different through every single temperature range that I had it, different from the beginning of my palate down into my throat. Um, the smell evolved over the, the, the time I was drinking the beer. I mean, that, that's what I love about beer. And it, and it shows you also how much of an agricultural product beer is. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that it's, it's an agricultural product. People think... Again, I think it's because of what Americans have thought about beer for so long um, has been this, you know, big stainless steel tanks and an Anheuser-Busch, you know, factory. Um, they don't see that beer, like what you're producing, um, is just as much agricultural as wine is. And beers like this should be held in the same regard. I mean, you're, you can taste, like, I asked you the questions about whether you're trying to go for your own kind of terroir. I mean, I've had three or four of them now, and I can tell there's a, there's a significant kind of like sense of this is Corey's beer as I'm going through them. Um, so I, I like that you are turning people on to this sense of, you know, this is an agricultural product. And it's also really cool that you're going out to these farmers and you're seeing it from start to finish, literally, because that's something I guess – Coming from a wine background, you don't get to do it. Which is why you didn't get into winemaking in the first place. Was yeah. I don't get full control over the ingredients. Well, now I don't necessarily have to, but I can go get some really high quality stuff right down the street. Um, do, you, do you find that, that satiates your need to <laughs> the wine? No, no, it's it's great this this season. So I always late summer is almost fruit season, if you will, for me. Like I source. I'm I'm every week just going somewhere to get fruit, and it it was funny this year realizing between perennial and side project how much fruit I was picking up, 
And like, this is awesome that my job right now is technically a brewer is to pick up fruit. And that is so old world. That is so old world the way beer used to be, you know, where you would just go get local fruit and you would, you know, put it in your sour beer to offset some things. And it was, it was a lot of fun this year. And it kind of, it, it was the first time that I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is great that the way I've come full circle and, you know, I don't have to go out there and, you know, prune back some of the vines on the on the the grape vines in the middle of a hundred and five degree day, but I get to come down here and get the grapes from you guys when you're done, and I'll go put them in my beer. I can do the fermentation side and create what I want to create on that. So, um, yeah, it, it is. It's 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 cool to see it through that way. And I went to, let's see here, I went to three three crushing sessions this year between the grapes we got where. I was there with the winery, helping with them. Well, helping. They have so many machines now, but watch them destem, crush, press, and then send me the must. So I would take the must back for our beers. Uh, I got a Savant beer cell for a perennial, 100% Brett with um, Chamberson must, but Chamberson is a noir hybrid. We do a Savant Blanc now perennial, which is 100% Brett beer with Chardonnay grapes, um, just like the white grape uh, Blanc de Blanc. And then um, this year for Side project. I missed out on the Chardonnay for side project for Blanc de Blanc again, but um, I got some Chamberson grapes. Actually, while I was there, while they were pressing the Chamberson grapes, I was eating them. And I was like, I'm gonna buy some right now. Like, do you have any extra? And they're like, yeah, whatever you want. I was like, I'm gonna buy some. These are beautiful Chamberson, and um, I added them to a beer, and it's gonna be called Punch Down, like a cool wine making procedure for a red wine for red grape sour that I have. That'd be. Nice. I love the names. How do you come up with those? I hate naming so beer. Hard. Naming beer is so hard. Naming the naming of beer is the worst part in the world. It, <laughs> oh my gosh, naming a beer is the hardest part. It's I swear I because I'm picky. I'm picky, but I also I'm, I'm not creative. That's not my creative side. You know, like we were talking earlier, that's not my creative side at all. And um, so it ends up becoming a, a brainstorming session slash emails back and forth between me, my wife, and um, my buddy Tim. Tim does all of our label design. So. Lots of thesaurus.com, lots of dictionary.com. I mean, seriously, like you come up with a word and you look, like where does this lead us? Like how do we go from there? And um, yeah, or just me randomly, randomly something to pop in my head and I'll look it up on Beer Advocate and Ray Beer and make sure there's no other beer named that. I'm like, all right, that's a name. Now and your wife came from the sales side, so I'd imagine she helps out a lot with this angle. Um, she, just tends, she tends to disagree with all of my, uh, my, my options, uh, which is great. <laughs> We very we're very we're very uniquely different in um in our backgrounds for the beer side. You know, she worked for Goose Island and Deschutes, and um she was amazing. She's so organized and everything. And she's helped so much for side project. And then when I do side project side, um, it, it's great to now have three people: Tim, her, and me. So if there's two of us against the other one, it's like, well, that's good, you know. And and I think that you know it's it's they 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 beat me out a lot on on things and ideas and and I agree with it cuz it's it's good and you know they're good they're good friends of mine I mean this is my wife obviously and we work really well together and then Tim's a great friend of mine and and yeah, I can't argue with the direction side project's gone you know thanks to their help as well so yeah, you you get a lot of really awesome uh, I don't know why this the answer you just gave me right at, like triggered this question in my head but you get a lot of really awesome reviews online um, like you were talking about Beer Advocate, you look up any of your beers, you're 93 and above on everything. Um, it's crazy. How do you take how do you take negative commentary on the beer? Not good. I'm not good at that. I I, I because our company's so small, because Side Project is, you know, when it comes to the brewing side of it, it's me. I take it personally, but I guess I should take it personally because personally, it's just you know, it's just me. There's not like a you know, there's not a company I'm hiding behind or anything. It is side project, but yeah, it's tough. It is tough. There's sometimes you're like, man, I want to reply to that person so bad, and you just can't. There's <laughs> people that are so wrong, you know, or, or things, uh, you know, and, and that's bad for me to say wrong because everybody, you know, it's part of an opinion and it's part of how right. all this works and it's part of those websites that people review negatively, people also review positively, and that has been probably the biggest driving force behind the success of Side Project than anything is those websites. Right. So, yeah, it's only yeah. it's only funny. It's only funny when I don't know. Just people put words in my mouth almost. Like Corey missed the mark on this one, 
and like, whoa, uh, I did exactly what I wanted. I'm sorry that you don't like it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, like Corey missed the mark. Like, what, what did Corey do? Let me know because I guess I missed it. So let me uh, know what my mark was. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the only time. <laughs> that's the only time it frustrates me is when when that stuff happens. But yeah, you know, these beers aren't for everybody, and no beer is for everybody. And there's right. going to be positive, negative, and and you take it in stride and. Um, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a dangerous aspect to these websites because, you know, beer is a very subjective thing. I think, and and it's and it's. I've found some beers. I had one yesterday that I found completely gross, and the people I was drinking with loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's why you know, for example, that's why when on my website I don't put any like number ranking on a beer. I, I just kind of tell you what I thought and tell you what I tasted and. I, because the number ranking to me is kind of like so subjective, um, you know. So there's, I think it's a little bit of a danger to those websites when they say somebody, you know, again, you haven't gotten any of this, but they say somebody else's beer sucks, and all of a sudden, like the hype train is like, oh, this beer sucks, but maybe, maybe it doesn't, you know. Luckily, you've been on the receiving end of positive commentary. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, I, you know, I've had some, I've had some negative, and, and one of, like, one of them was the original batch of the origin, um, with, I've only batch of the origin, and the origin is a blend of an imperial stout, uh, a Baltic porter, and like this massive oat wine, which had these sherry notes, and it's drinking delightful right now, and the sherry in it is a fruity sherry note, like it has this old, you have to, I mean, if you've ever drank sherry or port, I love port wine, I love yeah. sherry. Not a lot of people, not a lot of people on the beer side have been sit, can tell you, like, yeah, I sat down and drank some sherry, and I understand what you're talking about. Really, truly understand what sherry means. Right. And um, it was funny because somebody reviewed it as infected. And then immediately it was like infected, infected. You know what I mean? Then immediately this whole thing had started, and it's that power of, you know, of, of just that perception. People going into it going, I've heard this is infected. And then they taste something right. they don't recognize, and they go, that's infected. So right. I immediately the beer off and that was one of those that was one of the worst experiences for me as a professional brewer because I took it so personally and I was I was terrified because I never want to make I want to make sure that I'm you know that I'm making the best beer I possibly can and at the end of the day I have to se I sell those things to you and then I would feel personally responsible for that so I sent the beer off and had it um, tested you know I took my time money and everything and had it tested and there's only 186 bottles of that so the likelihood of one bottle being infected and the other bottle not you know or you know, so I sent this bottle off. Everything came back clean. Everything came back great. So the likelihood, in from my you know like chemistry background, the science side background, the likelihood of this one bottle being affected and these other one not, pretty rare. You know, because I bottled it off one gun, hand bottled it, bottle conditioned off one beer gun. Don't right. bet every bottle. You know, every 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 bottle. Yeah, bottle see, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, that's it, it, so. Uh, how how many breweries can say that they do that? And it's, that's well, just on that batch. After that, I quickly learned that I'm going to get a better bottling system, which uh, is just a wine filler, really. It's a five bottle wine filler that's all gravity fed, goes faster. But but yeah, after that beer, you know, and I heard that, and there's still people. After I had it in, tested and sent out my response to it, I typed out like a response and posted it. I still had people after the fact going, "No, trust me, the one I had was." I'm like, "Trust you how? Like your palate is better than the lab." Like, tell me, you know, you were trying to tell me that, and what can you do? So you're just like, I understand. I'm sorry. What can I do? And, you know, and that's, but but that's that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that those people weren't happy with it, and I apologize for that. It's just, yeah, those negative reviews, things like that, people know better than you do even. That's where I get weirded out. I'm like, no, I, well, you know, I need to ignore it, and, and I've gotten a lot better about ignoring it, and, and you just stay off of it. But... Don't let me talk too long about that because of the, you know because of those websites. That's what's driven the side project sales and demand more than anything. You wouldn't have, you've never would have heard about side project had it not been for those websites, probably. Sure, I mean, yeah, it's true. Um, it would have taken, and, and so they do so many great things, and the people on them. There's great people on there that know exactly what they're drinking and tasting, and those are fun to read because I've read too many of them now, but I understand the people like, all right, I trust that person's palate, and they they do a really good job with thoughtful responses to sure. this is how it tastes and like I agree with that person so I don't know yeah that's just me on the reviews I, I probably shouldn't have talked about it uh, just, I may have I may have struck a chord there I don't <laughs> no you didn't strike a chord it's just yeah but it's personal like imagine somebody I, I, especially when you're when you're when you're making a hundred and 
85 bottles of it. I, I, I'm sure it is. Um, and, that's, and that's why I brought it up because yeah. um, one guy that doesn't know what the hell he's talking about writes infected and all of a sudden everyone on the internet thinks the beer is infected and it's really not. It's, it's like I can imagine if, if it's my beer, I, I would be sitting there behind the computer just like, you know? like you know, all I could do is have it tested. I mean, it truly tore me up too. I mean, like, cause per I felt personally responsible, but all I could do is have it tested. And then after the test came back, like, what can you do? Like, I can't send all these beers off to get tested, and I can't test the one you drank. So right. you could be right. You know, maybe your bottle was an anomaly. But right. once that one review starts, then it seems like things multiply. Like, all of a sudden, everybody's got the infected bottle. What the hell in the hell that? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, it's exactly what you wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. I drank one just the other night, and I was like, damn, I'm really happy with that beer. But, yeah, whatever. Well, we, were, we were talking before we started the actual uh, conversation here, the live conversation, um, about the new tap room, tasting room for oh, Cyber yeah. Project, um, which recent, I think opened the last uh, two weeks, maybe two weeks ago, the ninth, I think. Last Tuesday. Yeah, whatever that was. Whatever, yeah, I don't know what day we're, I don't even know what day it is today. Um, 21st, I think I just, yeah, I had to look it up. Ah, whatever. Whenever, whenever last Tuesday was is when it opened up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so we were talking about now you get the now people are kind of like weirded out by the ability to actually try your beers on a regular basis versus waiting in line uh, for three hours to get two bottles and go home with two <laughs> basically two servings of beer. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess are you changing your approach to brewing now because the tasting room is open? Not my approach to brewing by any means. My approach to packaging it will be. Um, I'll make more. I'll make more draft. Um, keg conditioned. Nothing's going to change the flavor. There's a little difference in flavor between keg conditioned and bottle conditioned. Um, even though it's the same concept, it's just that the beer. I don't know if it's a pressure in the keg or what or larger volume. Um, it tastes a little bit different, but. Nothing super noticeable, but yeah, I will be doing more kegs so I can have more for the draft there, and then I'll uh, I'll save a lot more beer for the tasting room. Where if you want to drink that beer, your option for that beer is to just come there and sure. drink it there. So um, yeah, I mean, and that goes back to some of that conversation we had earlier about how beer used to be. You know, you drink your local brewery, you went to your local butcher, you went to your local bread maker, and and um, we were really inspired by Europe when we were over there, and some of these beers just won't ever probably leave St. Louis now. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it all goes, but uh, I would like to have a lot more available there. I, I want people to, if they come to the tasting room, they can have a great selection of side projects. You know, I don't want it to even be out gone there as well. Like, it's got to be somewhere. I have to I gotta figure out a way to get keep these beers available somewhere. And by making you consume it on, on site and not being able to take it to go, that should help because the people that really want to come in and actually drink and enjoy these beers will be there as opposed to um, the people coming in immediately to sell them online like we were talking about. My, one of my two releases ago, there was a beer, two of my beers showed up online for sale immediately afterwards. And it's kind of like, man, you come in and took the, you know, it's just frustrating. You're kind of like, ugh. I, I, <laughs> enjoy, you know, drink it or sell it yourself and drink it later. I don't mind or trade it. If you trade it, that's fine too. But like you're personally, the only reason you came there was to sell it. And it's like, all right, there, somebody else in line didn't get some because you were there to try to just profit. And it's like, oh, whatever. Right. So by making you come in, if you're just trying to make a buck, you can't make a buck and drink it there. You know what I mean? Right. I'm like, yes, you'll, you're going to actually lose some bucks. You're going to be giving me the dollars, and you're going to have to drink it there, and you can't take it home to profit. So, right. so that will slow some of it down. But, yeah, I mean, I want to grow, and I still want to have beer be able to go. And the trading aspect and the, the sharing aspect of my beers is really what's driven side projects. People know about our tiny, tiny little brewery that I never would have expected. So, just back, trying to make back to the idea, back to the idea of like a neighborhood uh, brewery and and the the fact that this is kind of like starting starting up again. Uh, do you feel any responsibility for what people think your neighborhood's beer should taste like? Um, I am right next. Well, I'm about a block away from Schlafly Bottle Works. This is the full production brewery of Maplewood Schlafly Brewing. So Maplewood will always be Schlafly, no matter what. So we're just kind of a little guy over the side, and I can just make whatever I want and uh, and do that. So it would be cool to then be, you know, the flavor of Maplewood, but we'll never be that by any means. We're just way too small compared to Schlafly. Um, but we're gonna start working with some. We got a butcher shop going in. 
Um, a guy that does the whole, I don't know the terms, like he breaks down the whole animal and uses every last bit of the animal, and whatever he doesn't use, he makes dog food out of it. Like it goes into dog food he's going to make there too. So the whole animal is going to get used. Like it's crazy. So we're going to start working with him to do some meat and cheeses. And um, we have a guy up the street that makes strange donuts. They're called strange donuts. And we've already teamed up with him before to do some beer at Perennial and some fun things. So it's cool that our little neighborhood there is really growing. And uh, cool. It, it'll be fun that hopefully some people start associating Side Project actually with Maplewood as well, as opposed to just St. Louis and just Missouri, like this little neighborhood where you can come enjoy it as well. So. You, and you just released a, a collaboration with Perennial, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, is there any collaborations in the future that you're kind of planning right now or that you would love to be able to plan? Um, yeah, so currently in Barrels, I have a collaboration with DeGuard Brewing out of Tillamook, Oregon. Um, it's going to be impossible <laughs> to get. <laughs> well, it's not a very large batch, so we'll see. It, it'll, it'll have to be. It's pretty experimental. We kind of went out there for sure on this one a little bit with uh, with our yeast cocktails. So we used his wild cocktail from Oregon in uh, a beer recipe that I wrote here, which I, you know, I've never worked with his cocktail, and that's the biggest thing is trying to hone in on what your cocktail does. So using his cocktail in the beer that I wrote. Um, Aged in an Angel Envy port barrel. So Angel Envy, Angel's Envy, it's a bourbon and finish in port. So it was a port barrel. So it's a 10% amber sour in a port barrel that had Angel's Envy in it, with, and it also has Oregon plums. So back out to Oregon, has Oregon plums in it. So we'll see. Um, I don't know. It's been in the barrel for a while. It's kind of, I'm letting it mellow out a little bit. It's a big, big beer. And then um, I also have a collab with Off Color going, which is a lot of fun. John Laffler is a great friend of mine up in Chicago. John and Dave came down here. Two awesome dudes for our Midwest Belgian Beer Fest, and we brewed a saison. Um, they like saison. I like saison. We make saison. Yeah, their uh, Apex Predator is amazing. Oh God, they could just drink that beer. I love that beer. Absolutely love that beer. Um, we use their house sack strain, my house Saccharomyces strain. We're gonna blend them together in a malt bill that's more familiar for them than me. Uh, I write a lot different malt bills than they do for saison. It's crazy how different we can be with my funky cocktail in it. First time I've used uh, some French oak, French oak punchins. So they're Pinot Noir punchins with a wild bread strain, Napa bread strain in them. So we'll see when it departs. Um, I'm excited for that beer. Collab, I'm um, to make sure I, oh, I have a perennial collab too. So I have the side project perennial collab as well. It's funny. So the side project, the perennial side project collab, I brewed all of that for perennial and for side project. And then the side project perennial collab, I brewed all of that. For side project for you, so it's yeah. fun. It's just a lot of fun. That's the whole point of this. The whole point of this is to have fun. You know. Yeah, just, when I saw that come out, I said, "Wow, what are, <laughs> that's a funny one." Because it's just about having fun. It's all it is. I swear. Just is uh, there a so man? I, the the guard is gonna be amazing. Oh my god, jeez. Is there is there a brewery like if you could tomorrow like snap your finger and you're doing a collaboration with one brewery around the world? What would it be? Uh, probably Sante Adarius. Not probably. It would be Sante Adarius. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we could all talk about doing class with the Lambda guys and everything, but they do their own thing, and they're never going to do anything different. I would love to work with Tim um, at Sante. I've met him in Adair now uh, twice. I've uh, been out there and love them. They're amazing people, which is uh, important to me. I just really like the great people I've met in the industry. There's a lot of people making good beer, but I just like being around the good people making good beer, too. And uh, the time I spent with them hanging out has been just great. Um, love their brewery, love their beers. Um, Saison Bernice is still one of my favorite Saisons I've ever had, and um, a little more acid for it than some other ones, and I love it. And if I could work with him and do a beer, we've talked about it, and we're just so, all so busy, I think that it's never just come to fruition. Maybe next year um, I can get back out there and brew with him, and maybe he can come down here, or we can just do one of those online ones where we just email back and forth. But I'd love to work with him. And then um, – I would love to work with Sean. I would just like to meet Sean from Hill Farm Shed. Um, never met him face to face, you know, and actually just sat down and chatted and just talked beer. Um, I know he loves champagne as well. I love champagne, uh, wine background, all that fun stuff. It'd be fun probably actually to sit down and drink beer and just drink champagne all night. Like, sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, hey, 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 dude, you want to sit down and drink champagne tonight? All the good, you know? yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, there's there's a, a craft to that as well. And um, oh yeah. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be a lot of fun, but I would just, yeah, I, I, God, if I could ever work with uh, either of those two gentlemen right now, um, or anytime soon, it'd be cool. It'd be really cool. That's, that's cool. I, I, now, you said, it's kind of like a, I should have asked this a long time ago, because 
this is kind of one of those questions I wanted to ask you. You said, I know you said before that you you thought it would be a really long time before you ended up um, jumping into your own venture. You thought you'd be a perennial for a very, very long time before you did that. So what was it that changed your mind to say, well, i got to start a side project now? They gave me the opportunity to start it right now there. Um, when you know, that, that was the whole thing was like Phil saying, you know, I, I could see you wanting to do your own thing eventually. And my, my answer was, yeah, it'd be awesome. But I hadn't started on, you know, I hadn't really started on getting financing together. I hadn't started on actually thinking out my process. I hadn't started anything. You know, the actual nitty gritty, as much people always like, I'm going to start a brewery. Like, there's a lot to go into just starting a brewery. Let's be honest. Come on. Right. So many people go around, I have a brewery next year, and you haven't started anything. There's no chance in hell you're going to get that done. So um, that was when he started training me on how to leave, not how to leave, how to do it. And um, they gave me the opportunity when they said, why don't you start it here? No longer did I have to build the financing. Did I have to get the licensing? Did I have to find a building? That's why it started so fast. Um, sure. And and they know that like I, I love my job at Perennial. I love my job at Perennial. And so hence the reason that I'm not even trying to look outside of perennial. If I ever get anything outside of perennial, it'd be a barrel warehouse just so I don't step on their toes anymore, but I'm not leaving because I'd still do all my production there and just transfer the wort, you know, to my fermentation area or whatever. Right. So that's what started it was they just gave me the opportunity. If they would have never said, hey, Corey, just do it here now, I would still be just thinking about doing this stuff. You know, it, it, it may, no, it's only been two years. It probably still wouldn't be open. It just takes a long time to get those things together. So right. that's what, yeah, that's what started yeah. I mean, you're pushing, I know that you're, obviously, if anyone's has tried your beers, you see that, you know, yeast forward uh, beers, uh, and, and you're pushing the limits on fermentation. How, how far do you think that we can actually, um, how much further do you think we can actually push these limits on, on beer production in the United States? Are we just still in, in the infancy stages? Are we still just kind of learning, taking baby steps towards uh, just what we can do with yeast, with bacteria with fermentation, uh, I guess based on your experience with, with all those things? I'd say, yeah, we're still at the beginning just because of um, there's so many, you know, yet to be discovered Brett and Lacto PDO strains, you know, re regional strains. Like the Brett Lacto PDO, whatever you could catch maybe down in Florida, if you can catch any, which you will, would taste different than what I have up here. So what would you say? The orange groves. Exactly. Exactly. So there's a lot still yet to be found. It's just unfortunate that the labs have always been, because of the wine industry, there's so much money in the wine industry, the wine industry's hated Brett. They've done everything they could to keep Brett out of everything. We're now, we're the beer industry, we want Brett strains. So the labs have never really focused on, hey, I'm going to actually isolate. You call up any lab and they have, what, 40, 50 different Saccharomyces strains, but they have one or two Brett strains. You know, that's it. So there's a lot still yet not discovered slash not isolated. Um, and that growth on that side is still exponential, I think. Um, there's still a lot of bad sour beer out there. There's still a lot of, uh, uh, of cleanliness that could be, be applied to these beers and, and their production that will benefit the entire industry as well. So, um, you know, as those get better and as people start experimenting more, I think we'll find more house flavors out there that work. We'll start seeing more regional beers. Um, it would be great. You know, Lambic is from a specific region of Belgium. It would be great to start seeing this, the beers of St. Louis slash down through this band into Nashville or something. Taste, you know what I mean? Like it'd be great right. to see that these these wild beers that are in, that that the people are actually using wild yeast and bacteria are starting to kind of have this similar characteristic or you know resemble each other. It'd be awesome to see that. I don't know if we'll ever get that in depth. Right. I don't know, but yeah, so I think there's a lot still yet to be to be. Um, with with a lot of especially this style these styles of beers where I mean that, that that harkens back again to the wine industry you got Napa Sonoma I, I, all these different counties next mm -hmm. to each other and the and the wines are so uh, I mean to a palate that's used to drinking these wines you can tell differences between the regions um, that'd be awesome <laughs> I never wouldn't, thought about that wouldn't it be great like we're sour like we're a Acid forward sour beers were readily available because that is really truly the beer of the area, and that's how beer all used to taste. And you know, if you drink a Jester King saison, um, which 
Ron, I had the pleasure of meeting. I would love to work with Jester King. That'd be awesome to go down there and uh, and hang out with those guys and do and brew some beer as well. But um, yeah, you drink a Jester King, which they have wild yeast and bacteria in their site for saison cocktails, and um, it has its own very unique, beautiful, delicate um, characteristic. And then you know Sean's beers up in in Vermont has his wild yeast and bacteria and some of his stuff that are just really delicate and just absolutely luscious and beautiful. So. Um, yeah, it's cool to start seeing how different there's similarities, but the similarity I think is the is the acid and too many people's their palates still aren't in tune enough to to realize that not all sourness is the same sourness. They're so different and varying, and you need to understand that they're still get past the sourness and what's underneath that that's complementing everything. And the the beers are so unique, uniquely different but delicious because they're those are well well made producers for sure. Right. So I guess kind of. Wrapping it up, what is your, what's your goal in the next year for side project? And then I guess if you could look ten years from now and you're, you're brewing, you got a couple of white hairs in your beard. What is? <laughs> already got one. This year was pretty. It was a pretty, pretty long year, but. <laughs> no, no, ten years from now. Ten years from now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty years from now. <laughs> Twenty years hard. What's, so, I guess the, the the question is, what's your short term kind of goal for side project? And then if you could see yourself 10, 15, 20 years from now, you still got side projects going strong. What would going strong mean for you and side projects? Man, um, this year coming up, I don't know how much more I'm going to grow this year, really, coming up. I've got a 70 hectoliter fooder as well. Um, i got another one coming in. Um, yeah, this year, I mean, if I produce the same amount of beer, I'll be happy. This year, I really will. Um, it's not about the, but that's not. That's really not about my thing. My thing is not about the volume. You know, it's not really about volume. But if I can, if I can bring out some new beers that have been as good as the beers I did last year, and people like them as much, that to me is a successful year. Really. Sure, and, and this question could be not not necessarily. It doesn't have to be um, volume, like like you were saying. It yeah. could be conce conceptually. What what would you like to see side project become? In theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Long term. I mean, what what would your kind of goal be? It doesn't have to be volume, but yeah. If you could have like if 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 ten years from now, uh, you know, I'm still relevant enough for you to sit down and talk to me. Um, what would you want me to describe your brewery as? If I'm still in business ten years from now, and you would want to sit down and talk to me, right? I'm still around here. People are still <laughs> drinking the beer. I don't know. You have to sit, maybe one day everybody's like sour beer sucks, and that's the end of it. But uh, um, it would be. <laughs> Yeah, it would be great in ten years to to look at you know having sour beer more readily available um, and having side project be a part of that. Um, there's still not enough sour beer out there. I, I love sour beer, and I would love for people to when they think of sour beer maybe think of side project every now and then. And that's all I want. I don't I don't need to be big. I don't need to be huge. I don't need to be even a favorite or anything. I just I just want to continue to make the beer, and if I can continue to make the beer and um, have our little business, I'm happy. You know, um, ten years from now, I probably won't be. I don't know. I don't think I'll be bigger. It's I, I've never been given, you know, because I also work at Perennial. I've never taken forty hours of my week, or actually, it's not even close to forty hours, but like sixty hours a week. I've never taken like sixty hours a week and just devoted it all towards side project. And if I did do that, maybe. Maybe I would make quite a bit of beer. I don't know. But I would like to have that opportunity in the next 10 years to be like, all right, my focus is just to figure out what I like to do and just make beer, which I'm already almost there. So I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with where my spot is right now, just making some beer. That's about it. So. <laughs> That's awesome that you're, that you're almost there and you're so young relative, <laughs> relatively to – that's good, hey, you know? I don't know if, that, if that's what you're looking for. Like if you're like, oh, I want to – 30,000 square foot facility and I want to have a 30 barrel no, no, you know what I, I don't I don't I actually wouldn't necessarily want that <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I'd be yeah. having I don't think I'd be enjoying this beer as much if you had that um, <laughs> yeah I don't know yeah I, I like the fact that like your hands touch every single aspect of this beer um, and, and going back again to Europe you spent time in Europe I, I studied abroad in Europe I spent a lot of time in Europe nice and and um it's it's one of those things that you gotta you gotta drag me out of Europe kicking and screaming because I love being able to go down the street 
and have you know the same meal, or the same type of meal prepared differently, and, you, and you're watching someone make it with their own hands on yeah. a little stove. Um, they they treat you know cured meats like I'm talking about Spain specifically. My family's Spanish. You they treat cured meats like if it's you know from God, <laughs> and so it's like. That's, awesome. that's what I love about this beer. That's I think like why I've connected so much with the stuff I've had from you is that you get that same sort of artisan feel to what you're doing. I I don't really want you to become. <laughs> oh, I won't. I mean, I I don't know. I feel like Sapphire would be different if you know it was somebody else brewing and blending. You know, but that's the whole reason I started Sapphire so I could brew, so I could blend. You know? Right. That's what I like to do, and I didn't want to start just to not do that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, God, I guess if you want to side project now at the point, I could contract brew out my beer and let somebody else make it for me. I could sell, sell the beer and, uh, but that's not the point for me on this side of it. And, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Talk to me later and we'll see, um, if this business was a smart idea or if it was just a, <laughs> was a smart if, I'm, if I'm just really tired all the time now and, uh, you know, for nothing. Uh, but no, but no, it's, uh. So far, so good. So Someone far. told me if you're not tired, you're not succeeding. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's always a good tired. <laughs> right. yeah, it's, always, it's always a very good tired. I sleep, I sleep very well now for sure. But uh, between nice. the three, businesses, between the three businesses, it's good. But uh, yeah, yeah. As long as people like you are enjoying the beer, then I, what else can I do? I, I wish I could. I wish I get this beer more often. I mean, it's like, like I was telling you because it's so limited. Uh, you know, getting your beer <laughs> is next to impossible. Um, so I feel really blessed that I've been able to drink an entire bottle by myself, you know. <laughs> so, um, but, hey, this has been... Uh, I told you I was really excited about doing this uh, conversation with you. Um, I meant it. This has been awesome. Uh, I've learned a hell of a lot from talking to you for this last... Look at that, hour and a half now. Yeah. And, and, you know, thank you so much for, for, for taking time out of your no busy, very busy day to do this. Um, what you're doing is is amazing. And it's, it's um, everything I've had is so, so beautiful. Um, again, it's, like I've said on this website, and people are going to kick my ass for saying it again, you know, I started off with wine. And, and I was searching for that. I got hit by a couple beers that were kind of like, oh, okay. And... Coming across side project, learning about your history, and then tasting the beers, it's all kind of come together into kind of like the perfect storm for me as a first love of wine for now a beer drinker. Um, so you're doing an amazing job. I think I'm sure if you keep it up, we will be talking hopefully ten years from now that I'll still be around. I know you will, and uh, we'll be laughing about you know tiny the tiny production and. Uh, <laughs> You'll well, find a way to do it. I'm confident. Well, they're about the same size. They're like, oh, so you grew by ten oak barrels in the last ten years. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, that's all I do. I'm just kind of happy a now. A barrel a year. A barrel a year. Yeah, I just kind of move around slower now because I'm getting older, and it kind of works for me. But <laughs> oh man, but in all seriousness, you know, thank you. I'm gonna end this now. Yeah. Um, but. Um, Hopefully the next time uh, that we're doing something together. Well, actually, ten questions on Monday will be side project brewing. Uh, oh, cool! How's uh, that? You just post them up or what? How's I'm gonna that? post them up on Monday. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, um, so Dude, I hope I edited them. I didn't even look. I guess I hope I didn't. I, I typed it out and they're like, I don't edit very well. So hopefully I don't look like an idiot in my spelling error. I'm, I'm not gonna edit it. Anyway, so. <laughs> no, I think I think I did. Or I was just saying that. <laughs> Hopefully the next time we're doing this in like in like person, you know, and yeah. Um, but I'll come to your studio. Hey, my studio is you know kind of yeah. like my house. <laughs> yeah. Next time you do this, you'll have a studio, and we'll have you'll have a you have a radio show or something talking about beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's my ten year goal. You know. There you go. <laughs> so, all right, man. Um, thank you. If you you know, uh, everybody, Corey King, side project, perennial. Uh, if you if you can get the ability if you have the ability to get your hands on some, I definitely recommend it. Um, he's doing some amazing things and thank you. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.